Manassas Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Greetings. This is Paul Holden Graber, your host for the Quarantine Tapes, brought to you by Onassis, LA. And Dublab. I am thrilled to announce that we have asked various former quarantine tape guests to host during a week guests of their choice in total freedom. They have absolute carte blanche. This week, I have asked the very great poet Naomi Shiab Nye to guest host. I hope you will enjoy these quarantine tapes. Hello. Hello. Naomi? This, yes, this is Naomi Shihab Nye, your friend, uh, Helen Drutt English. I'm so happy to hear your voice. Please tell us where you are today. I am in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I am currently sitting in my library, which is my favorite room in the entire house, and which has been my savior during the past months. Yes, and and your house, which I have had the enormous pleasure of seeing in person in my lifetime, tell us about your house, because it's really quite extraordinary. Oh, my house was built in 1847. It's actually two small row houses that are joined by a city garden. Um, the 2220 side has remained uh, as it was originally with a separate parlor and a long hallway. The other side, which has become my guest house, has was excavated in 1940 into, you know, large single rooms, and it destroyed the original uh, aesthetic of the original row houses. Uh, and these row houses are singular in Philadelphia because there are only four or five blocks of this kind of structure left. They were called workers' houses. That meant that you were, you know, you were probably a worker in one of the department stores or in one of the warehouses, but you, you know, you, you were at a, you were not at the highest level of society or even the second highest level of society, but you were part of that society, which had a very, you know, good income, steady job. And a, and a home. And the widths of the homes were divided by 12 feet, 15 feet, 18 feet, 22 feet. My house is a little bit less than 12 feet wide so that the taxes are slightly lower than a 15 foot house. But it's one of the rare blocks still remaining in the city. And I am very happy. I've been here 57 years and I absolutely will never move. And and you have that feeling of being right at the heart of the city of Philadelphia, oh, don't yes. you? Yes. I'm two blocks. I can walk to Rittenhouse Square. Actually, my street bears the name of Rittenhouse Square because it is the last street of the south line of the square. So I'm a block, two blocks away from the square. And I'm in the heart of Philadelphia. I can walk to the library. I can walk to Barnes. I can walk to the Academy of Music. I can walk to my friend's house. I can walk to cafes. It's, mm. a, a, it's a community. You know, it's a real yeah. community. You can sit, you can stand in the grocery store, and you can be next to your best friend or one of your students. It doesn't really matter. And there's a kind of collective energy. And during the pandemic, uh, I have a friend who I've known for 56 years, Yvonne Bobrowitz, and she lives around the corner from me. She's a rather well-known weaver, and she's 56 years old, and she's a little bit frailer than I am. I'm 90. She's 50. No, she's 53. And we meet at the corner once a week at 23rd and Spruce at a at a at a sort of elegant 
I guess, takeout gourmet grocery store called Bacchus. And we sit and we talk about our past, our present. We're not so Mm. sure about our future because of our age. But I said to her last week, you know, we're like Samuel Beckett's Endgame. Instead of a trash can between us, we have a table, a cocktail table. (laughs) And we're sitting here. (laughs) <laughs> like two people in the end game talking about our life, talking about what we think about society, talking about literature, talking about music, talking about the frailty of existence. I said, Samuel Beckett is somewhere in our midst. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. You're at the heart of history, of literature. I'm glad that you have these rituals with friends uh, because that seems like it's been very important for some people during uh, these past many months, just to have some rituals develop, even if we don't get to be quite as close as we used to be. I I love that you use the word worker for the residents, the past residents of your neighborhood, Helen, Mm -hmm. because I think of you as truly one of the great workers in the world of arts and crafts and encouragement. Uh, I love how you've been called a passionate observer. I myself might call you one of the world's great enthusiasts. You've been a collector, a writer, a curator of your own gallery that you opened in 1974, a teacher, an ambassador for crafts. And I read that many call you the the main, one of the main compass centers of the whole advancement uh, and awareness of modern and contemporary craft movement. I mean, that is a huge thing. That is a huge life of work and commitment you've been part of. And recently when we spoke, you said that this past year, with due respect for all who've been suffering so much around us, this past year has had its own particular blessings for you. Um, could you talk about that? Well, that's absolutely true. I, I'm also a mother. Yes, <laughs> I and I was I'm going a, to say I think mother, I'm a really, I think I'm a really great mother. <laughs> yes, mother, I, you're lucky. And, and, and I've been, though many times, a devoted wife. Yes, uh, but uh, and that that's a whole other story. However, it has been a very interesting time uh, for me. I think that I have not been depressed. I have found that the pandemic and the isolation of 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 and the isolation caused by not having to go to meetings, not having to attend exhibitions, not going, even though I miss the opera, has given me a kind of solidarity and a kind of uh, a kind of, well, I'm I'm trying to explain it. I've been able to concentrate on, 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 on different, um, what's the word I'm using? I've been able to concentrate in a way that I had not been able to concentrate for a long, long time because I wasn't, you know, my, my, my brain wasn't being dispersed into a hundred different things. I had essays that were due some of them long overdue. I was able to concentrate on writing those essays, especially from the end of March to the middle of July, where I was totally isolated in New York because my building would not let anyone in other than a caregiver, including my children. And so I I led a very a very solitary existence, and I didn't mind it. I rather enjoyed it. I wasn't bored, and I didn't long for anything. I had a friend who occasionally came once a week on his bicycle and her on their bicycles and delivered homemade soups to me, but they left them at the door. So, And I also found that during this time, I was able to organize my library in Philadelphia when I had I had to leave New York because they were... Uh, restoring the building and putting in new windows. And I came back to Philadelphia where it was like a womb, you know. Uh, it was really wonderful to be here again. I had not been here for a long time. Uh, Peter died almost, it was t- it was two years ago. And I sort of 
attach myself to the apartment because it had so many of his memories. But then I came back to Philadelphia and my city garden became a place where an occasional artist would come knocking on the back of the door or John McBeckis when he was running to the Schuylkill River would knock on the door and they and the, the garden was a haven because there was oxygen, it wasn't secluded, it wasn't, you know, hands it wasn't body, don't come near me. And uh, it became a place where we met, we had conversations, uh, there, was, there were even oral histories, one or two oral histories were conducted in the back of the garden. And the library became a real focus point for me. All the doubles in my library were collected and boxed and we sent them to Temple University which established a library in my name, which was really a wonderful thing for them to do. And that was expanded to another find that I did, well, another discovery, because I was in the house and because I had not had so much time to be in this house for so many years. I had, I had you know, this house had been in my life for 57 years. But there were parts of the basement that I had neglected that I hadn't discovered. I hadn't looked at the abundance of material there. And I began, I had somebody come and we began to send books to the Brooklyn Metal Works or we send books to other institutions and we start packaging all the, all the abundance of material and archiving it to, to institutions and colleges and art centers that could take advantage of this material. And Naomi, something really remarkable happened. About four weeks ago, there were five or six cartons in the depths of the basement that were sort of hidden by other material that I did not realize I had, and they had belonged to Morris English, who had moved them here when we had married, and they were from his archives of 1967. And when we opened them, we found letters from Samuel Beckett, from Ionesco. Oh. It, it was hand, all handwritten, you know. Not, just, you know, just patiently waiting there in your basement. Just, you know, I had no idea that I had this material. Of oh. course, we married in 81, and, and, he, and he brought his library, and we established a library, but... I did not know that he had cartons from 1967 of materials from his life at that time that he had put in the basement, and I did not. I did not know about that, and oh, and there they were. And, you and, you must have taken so many deep breaths as I you. I did. <laughs> I called his daughter immediately. I called his daughter and let her know, and then I called Temple University because. Uh, there were also boxes and boxes of poetry books, many of them signed from, from contemporary poets from 1969, from 1948, from 1952, Amazing. from 19, yeah. 1955, Lisbon. You know, I, there was a kind of record. And I called Temple University, and I had his poetry books added to the material that I had given. And that was important because... Morris was the founding editor of the Temple University Press, and they had forgotten that. And he had, and he had worked with people like, uh, oh, I'm trying to, who wrote The Sovereign Son? Uh, I can't remember. Just now, it just went out of my, Odessus Elitis, right? The Greek poet who was yes. also a, he, he, so there were, so he had published the gold, the, the Sovereign Son by Elitis. So the, correspondence was in this in this in, the, in these boxes what a trove what a brilliant trove to discover right, right. I, and i i love that you kept on your detective work in the realm of the arts but within your own home you were finding things you didn't even know were there because there had been so much time passing and right because so many he, activities yeah he died in 1983 in wow. a, a year and a half after our marriage. So, uh, oh, and his it, library, which he had established in the house, went to his daughter. So this yes. was really a found treasure. A big treasure. And in his memory, you established the Morris English Poetry Prize, which was given 
uh, till now, right, to an but, older poet every year? Right, but that, it, it began, Goldway Camille was the one who helped me formulate how the prize should be established. Yes. And he said that it should go, I, at first I said a young poet, and he said, no, no, no. He said, Morris didn't publish until he was 55, and it should go to a poet over 55. And so in the beginning, there was a prize given every year to a poet you know, uh, over 55, and it was selected, and a judge actually selected the poet. And you were a judge one year. and I was. You, and you selected, uh, come on, from Dr. Pittsburgh. Samuel Hazo yes, of the, Pittsburgh. Right, of Samuel and Hazo. it was the right. greatest pleasure to select that wonderful poet and another great encourager of others, as you are. Uh, and how important that has been as, you know, giving that prize to an older poet has always been a kind of acknowledgement or awareness, deepened awareness of, you know, right. pay attention, pay but, attention to this person's work. What a great uh, legacy you created for, but it, for it, Morris. It ha but it has changed, Naomi. It changed because the amount of recipients you know, we're getting slimmer and slimmer. The amount of, of, of poetry books I was receiving was getting slimmer and slimmer. And I finally had a meeting, and I don't remember with whom, but I had a meeting with somebody at one of the uh, poetry associations. I'm trying to remember who it was, but I can't. I'm 90 years old. Sometimes my memory becomes a little... That's all right. <laughs> yeah, that um, name's in there somewhere. So no. we decided not to do the prize. But it was decided to invite a poet every year to to speak and to use the funds Lovely. to support yeah. a poet, you know, who would give a reading. And then, and then when Storm King canceled the readings, uh, the, the readings went to the American Irish Historical Society and the Rosenbach. So now the poet, the selected poet, and next year it's Susan Stewart because we didn't have the poetry readings last year because of right. the pandemic. Right. And she will read at the American Irish Society one day, and the next day she will read at the Rosenbach in Philadelphia. Beautiful. She'll come full round to yes. Philadelphia, which also pleases me. Oh, that's lovely. Helen, could you talk to us about, and I think this is something maybe we've had more of a chance in our quietude and isolation to contemplate in our own places, if we're lucky enough to have places to live in. Uh, talk about the instinct, the, the, the passion in many human beings to collect, to collect things. I read about a placemat in Canada long ago that launched your collector's eye. There was something about the weave or the colors of the placemat. Uh, I, I thought that was so gorgeous that right. it could be traced to a placemat. It was. Um, yeah, could you tell us about I, I, that? I still have it. I was, oh. in, I, I was in the Laurentian Mountains, and I was in a gift shop, and there was a placemat and napkins, and they were hand-woven, and I couldn't believe hand-woven placemats. You know, I didn't think that people wove placemats anymore. And I had been a student at Tyler, and we had a textile department. But, you know, the professor and the students were working on large textile, you know, structures and elements. Nobody was sitting at a loom weaving a, a, a placemat or a linen cloth. And I was very, <laughs> I was very taken by that. It grabbed you. Yes, yes it did grab me. And, and then from there... I went to visit George Nakashima in his studio in 19, I think it was 55, I think it was 54 or 55, and he had, you know, created his amazing woodworking studio in New Hope, outside of New Hope, Pennsylvania, on Aquitang Road, and here was a man who was making, designing and creating furniture by hand. You know, he had a studio with three or four assistants, but the concept was that the hand was an internal part of the creation of the work. And I realized that something was happening because, you know, at one point, Arthur Drexler at MoMA said that objects that were being made in the 20th century would all be made by industry and would be industrially made. And then the GIs came back and they wanted to find a way to be in control of their own life, their own creativity. 
and the hand became very important. The hand was a kind of symbol of survival in a mechanized society. And here mm. we were with people potting again and creating furniture and they were weaving and, and they were making, you know, objects for use, objects for the home, which eventually grew into another phase in which the crafts became part of the mainstream art, art society as well. So I was attracted to that. And I, as a young woman, you know, in my 20s, I would go to the studios and I would talk to Paul Evans, I would talk to Nakashima, I would talk to Eshrick, I would talk to Byron Temple. I wanted to understand why the hand and the handmaid had become so important again and so essential in one's life. Mm, beautiful. And you would become involved with so many great artists working in clay, metal, uh, jewelry. Uh, Rudolf Staffel was someone you and I shared a oh. uh, great love for Rudy. Uh, I met him first in Philadelphia. He instantly sang your praises and said you represented his work. And uh, and he had grown up in the neighborhood where where I live in Texas. And Rudy said something, you know, later on in our friendship that I wrote on a little card and kept with me always. And I think I even put it in the front of one of my books. He said, procrastination is the most creative act there is. Uh, I was so intrigued by that quote. How do you feel about it? Well, I think he was a master of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, he, I was, think, I think he, he, that quote is was his savior, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, and, and perhaps for Rudy, that really was appropriate and probably dominated his life. He once told me that my hand would never do what my brain wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, he told me that your brain danced and was, you know, charmed and connected to so many people and projects that your brain was much more full and rich than most people's brains. I mean, I remember him talking about you with such gusto and love. Well. And in a way, the whole this whole virus season has has felt as if uh, the world is procrastinating. We're all having to pause. Children are having to stay home. Um, so many people have put on hold their travel plans. Um, but I think, and I'm curious if you agree with this thought, that it's it's encouraged us to be creative in unexpected ways. Well, I think the pandemic has also allowed us to develop closer relationships with friends. We mm. We have quieter times on the phone. We speak to each other. Sometimes we Zoom and talk to each other. I mean, though I do not like FaceTime because it's very interruptive. I could be doing something, then suddenly, bang, you know, the telephone rings and it's FaceTime. But, you know, but I do think that there's been an opportunity to have deeper relationships with people that you care about. And, and, I, and I am very happy about that aspect of the quarantine, you know, the quarantine time that I've had to spend. And even with my children, though I did not see my daughter for months, but when she finally came here, you know, for my birthday, it was really wonderful. And Matthew's visits every week now. He comes Saturday night and he leaves Monday morning. There are deeper relationships being formed and deeper understanding of our love for each other and also... Uh, our lives, you know, uh, at first I was really upset that I felt that they were dominating me and telling me what to do. You know, I, I thought if I have to take a car and want to go to New York, I'm going to have to sneak out at two o'clock in the morning so that they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like the idea that I have long discussions with artists and, 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 and a few that live not far from here find their way into my garden. Uh, I find that I have a research assistant, uh, Colleen, who's upstairs now, right now, and we're working, she's working on the chronology for my book, which may never be published, but we keep hoping that eventually it will. I'm sure it will. But, but I, I am not unhappy. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling <laughs> that I've had an opportunity to really bring a lot, bring a great deal in my life together into a cohesive whole and that it has strengthened me. I feel really strong. I 
I, I love the idea that I don't have to do 10 things during the day, that I can sit and I can read if I need to read, I can write if I want to write, I, you know, if I, I do want to write, and, and I can feel a sense of structure and organization and also love. I feel a great deal of love coming from the people that I know. Uh, oh. my, my birthday, for instance, in the morning, there were 40 people congregating through Zoom to, to, to say good morning to me. That was just so moved. How beautiful. Right. I, normally, normally, we wouldn't have had 40 people in the morning on our birthday. No, no. And no. You know, now I right. understand why my children wanted me to go upstairs and get dressed. Oh, Helen, it seems as if your enormous energy for life and artistic creation has been a real soul sustenance for you now. And you've been able to to look at things closely and treasure them. I, I always loved the quote from Thailand. It doesn't have a name attached to it, but the quote is, life is so short, we must move very slowly. And in some ways, having fewer distractions We've been granted that privilege of moving more slowly, even amongst our own thoughts. That's true. And That's could, true. Could it, has, you... it has it has been a gift in a way. I think we should look at this time of regaining a healthy environment as a also a gift to us, even though there are many illnesses and many deaths, that if we abide by the rules, we have an opportunity to become a healthier person, an opportunity to become a better person. Because I think we've been given time to evaluate many things that we just dismissed during our lifetime. Yes. You know, and an opportunity to read poetry for two hours yes. if you want to. Yes. You know, we don't have to go to a meeting. We don't have to put the, bu- the book down. We don't have to go, you know, we, right. we, we can do that. And, and that's sort of amazing, don't you think? I do. And so many people have said, Oh, finally, I have the time to read poetry, which for those of us who've been reading it all along, but we're pleased that they've found that time. But we've also had a little more time. Helen, it's such a joy to speak with you. Could you just close us out by telling us something about your beautiful mother, Blossom? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Was that how, did you know, name, how did Blossom? you know about my mother? Blossom? Well, I met her. <laughs> I oh, that's right, 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 from right, her once, <laughs> right. Once. Yes, but she oh, was incredible. She was incredible, and 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 her memory. You know, I'll, I will never forget when Peter took her for her first ride through Storm King, and uh, that's and Peter Stern, Stern, her husband, right, who was in charge of Storm King. Yes, yes, he was co-founder. the co-founder of Storm King in 1960. And Peter died two years ago, November 12th, uh, when my mother, who at that time was probably 100 or close to 100, she died when she, no, she was not quite, no, she was still in her 90s at that time. And Peter took her for a ride through Storm King, and he wanted her to see Storm King and to know Storm King because it was a passionate part of his being. I mean, yes. you know, and, and, and they went for this wonderful ride, and when they were, you know, finished with the tour of Storm King, my mother turned to my darling Peter and said, when are you going to sell the land? She was extremely <laughs> pragmatic. She couldn't understand why he needed 500 acres in order to exhibit these works. <laughs> <laughs> and and how, how, what was the age she lived till? She was, I think, 10 days before her 105th birthday. And she wow. died in Cedar House at Storm King. We, bought, we brought her up to Mountainville during her last years and that was really wonderful she was a remarkable pragmatic woman i mean i used to say that my father would tell me what sheets to buy and my mother taught me how to make the bed (laughs) (laughs) well she certainly had a remarkable stunning daughter in you and i thank you so much for gracing the quarantine tapes and i hope someday you and Paul Holdengraber, my friend who's the founder of these quarantine tapes, can be in the same room because I do think the two of you are two of the great encouragers in the world. So, Helen, we send our love to you and thank you for for talking to me today. What a gift to be with you. 
Thank you. It's mutual, as you well know. I'm honored that I have been included, you know, uh, as a as a participant in the quarantine tapes, and I I hope I. I thank you, and I thank Paul as well. Thank you so very much. Helen, you're so great. Helen is the interviewer's dream. <laughs> Helen, I could talk to you for a hundred hours, and if we were on a train crossing Europe, we would never stop talking once. Yeah, thank you so much. Helen, you're beautiful. Thank you for all the, the wisdom you gave us. Thank you. You too, Helen. Bye. To support this show and DubLab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com slash support.